sorry I'm a bit late. I've got a stinking cold, which is a, one whole word and it's curious to Britain, a stinking cold. So if you can't hear me properly, you'll have to say so. I haven't settled my dispute with Adobe Incorporated yet, so there will now be a slight delay. If it's unacceptably long, I'll have to restart the PC as usual. Anyway, last time um, we talked about gain and bias and input and output impedances as terms that we could use to describe the properties of amplifiers. Right, it's done two slides now, just to spite me. I'm not going back. Um, and then we talked about the idea of ideal amplifiers in terms of, of their gain and their input and their output impedance. <coughs> We discussed what kind of amplifiers there could be, and we were talking about current amplifiers, which give a current out and take a current in, and voltage amplifiers, which give out a voltage and take in a voltage. And we talked about transconductance and transimpedance as well. And we said that transistors um, were, or could be described as a transconductance amplifier. And the bipolar junction transistor was a special case in which you could, if you wished, call it a current amplifier because it has a non negligible base current. But we also said that the base current wasn't a driving factor in how the transistor works. And actually it was transconductance that was important. And that in this course we would deal with only with transconductance because it was the, the factor that unites all the three terminal amplifying devices that we're going to talk about. That's some notes going around somewhere. After that we went on to describe well, I started on describing two biasing circuits, and we went through the first one on the, on the chalkboard um, by way of an example. And we also said that the terms that are dealt with in biasing the transistor can be completely removed from equations that describe its gain. That's to say, its small signal gain. Who's, who's missing some? Is it just you? Oh, you've got one, right? Okay, because you can have mine. Um, and then we actually analyse the circuit, and we're going to begin this lecture by continuing our tale of two circuits, um, and then we'll spend the middle part of the lecture discussing compromises that you have to make in biasing circuits. And you may remember I drew something in the other theatre on this board, which described the signals and where they're allowed to be and not allowed to be to keep the, the transistor in its forward active region, and uh, there'll be a little bit more of that. Then we need to talk about how we get signals in and out of the amplifier. And thereafter, we'll talk about our analysis of small signals as opposed to um, the DC conditions and the small signals. And just as we did for a diode, we can replace the transistor with a set of linear components um, which will allow us to think about its gain without having to worry about its biasing conditions. And then there'll be a review. If we don't finish all that, we'll carry on next time. So this is circuit two of circuits 1 and 2, and the, the new addition is the resistor R2. Um, so what I've said on the slide is, in this circuit RE provides negative feedback, so it's that one there. And it's the same kind of negative feedback as before. If you're not happy with it, don't panic, we'll <coughs> go over it again in this lecture. Um, but negative feedback is also provided um, by the current that flows, or yeah, the current that flows through R2, um, being a part of the, the overall uh, load current. So there are now two mechanisms of, of negative feedback. In fact, it's a, a current flowing through R2 that can affect BBE by virtue of the voltage across R1. But we'll, we'll go over that in a minute. So if the transistor attempts to increase its collector current, VC will be slightly reduced, and that's because the current flowing through RL will cause the voltage across RL to get somewhat bigger. And VC plus RL is equal to VS. So if this one's getting a bit bigger, this one will have to get a bit smaller. Um, so VC is reduced, and as a consequence, VB will be reduced as well because the collector current will fall slightly. And this this circuit will operate without RE because there is still negative feedback through R2. The other circuit won't operate without RE. Um, well. It will for a short period of time, but then one of several things will happen. It isn't, it isn't in the designer's interest to allow that. Um, so this circuit is often used at higher frequencies when we get towards the 
the sort of 30 megahertz or so region where we have to start worrying about traveling waves. Um, and we do that with RE equal to zero. The reasons for that um, will become apparent in the end, but I don't want to go into them in this course because they're not examinable and I think they might confuse things. So what about the biasing conditions? Well, So we're saying, you rightly said that the VS has to add up to ICRL plus I1 times that lot, which is all the stuff that flows. Down there, down there, down there. And then we can say I1, R2 is, is VE, which is That one there. So this must be R1 and this must be R2 on the, on the slide, is it? Or no? Uh, R2 is on the top one. Really? <coughs> there may be a mistake in my slides as well, though. Right. I will send out an email with some new slides once I've decided. Anyway, so what we'll have to say is that the voltage across voltage across RE and the voltage across VV will add up to 2K, and then you would choose the voltage that you want to live here, and you would decide upon your collector current. Having done that, you can then choose the current that you want to escape down there provided you know that you'll have to work out this value of resistor after you've made that decision, because the current that flows in there and the current that flows in there are the same, assuming you've written down there is no base current. There we go. So you'll end up with an expression for I1, which is the current that flows in the extra resistor, and an expression for um, IC and you have to eliminate them. So this is different from circuit number one, where there is no elimination required. You can do it all by looking at the circuit. In fact, if I was feeling a bit braver, I'd carry on with doing by the circuit, but I don't want to stand there for 10 minutes while I figure it out. So then you have to eliminate either I1 or I, IC, and you have to get an expression for VS and <coughs> the other one. So I've done it for IC on the slide with the possibility that that might have to be R1. And once you've done the elimination, you'll have expression 6, ideally. And then you can back substitute that into expression 4, which is on the prior slide, and you'll end up with an expression for VS, I1 and RL. So if you've chosen RL, you can get I1. And if you, uh, yeah, and if you've chosen I1, you could get RL. It isn't the result that's important, which is lucky, because I couldn't derive it. Um, it's the question of knowing the, or being able to analyse the circuit that's important. If you wish, I will make an extra <coughs> video of the correct uh, <coughs> chalkboard version of that. Speaking of videos, has anybody seen the Tutorial Sheet Solutions videos? Well, they're up on Hercules at the moment, and they take absolutely hours. So if you're struggling with the problem sheets, then you can have a look at my me standing in front of a chalkboard solving them for you. Of course, if you do that, you'll then not have the benefit of trying to figure them out. So I would advise you not just to sit there and watch me solving them, handsome fellow that I am. So with, with circuit one and circuit two, the only things you can actually rely upon are the VBE and um, the fact that Ohm's law applies. If you write out some equations and you've got VCE in them and VCB in them, then you cannot, you, it's extremely unlikely that proceeding will yield the right answer because you cannot depend on what VC is going to be and you cannot depend on what VCB will be. In 
fact, VCB should be negative as far as this circuit is concerned because that diode junction will be reverse biased. The assumption that IB is negligible really only means that the value that IB takes is sufficiently small compared to the current that flows in the bias of resistors that it doesn't make much difference. And you can say it doesn't make much difference to be 5 or 10% and that would be fine. Is that Mario or Link or Final Fantasy? So you have to choose one of these two bias circuits. Now, the, the fact of the matter is I would probably have chosen one for you and that would be the one that you're facing on the day. Um, but the choice in, in practice depends on the frequency of operation. And at low frequencies, we often use circuit one. And at higher frequencies, as I said earlier, we've got RE is zero and it's circuit two. And to check that the IB value is negligible, uh, or to check your approximation, you would say, well, what's the smallest HFE that the transistor has? And then you'd say, well, I know what my IC is, so I've done my calculations. So you can work out IB by dividing IC through by HFE. If the IB you get then is still less than, say, 10% of your biasing current, that's the current that flows through your resistor network to, to give you the 0.6 <coughs> place compared to the emitter, then that, that uh, assumption holds. If you were to choose the biggest HFE, that would not necessarily satisfy um, any particular transistor of that type because there's a wide range of HFE, as we said a couple of lectures ago. Now, the collector current and the collector voltage and the base voltage have some indirect effect on the signal conditions. Um, the collector current, of course, sets GM. Um, we'll see that later in this lecture, and we, we said it in a prior lecture as well briefly. But the collector, the collector to base reverse bias voltage also adjusts certain interelectrode capacitances inside the transistor. And we're not concerned with them in this course, but you may as well know they exist because at some point in the future you'll have to worry about them. And as we, we demonstrated last lecture in a, in a uh, chalkboard bit, the collector voltage affects the total available output swing. Um, because VC cannot fall below, um, well, we say VB, but what we really mean is we can't fall bias the base collector junction because if we do the transistor end saturation. So to obtain a maximum symmetrical swing, you'd have V supply plus VB divided by two is, is what your VC ought to be. Um, and the graph I had, I think it's on the next slide actually, so I won't draw it up. Um, and both VS and V effect, affect the maximum swing that's available because obviously you can't go any higher than VS <coughs> because if you do, you won't have any collector current because you won't have any voltage across your load resistor and you can't go below VE either um, because you'll end up saturating your transistor or you'll, you'll be on the way to saturating your transistor if you try and do that. But the value of VE is a free choice, more or less. If you had 10 volts available and you said I want my emitter bias in resistor value to be 9, that would leave you a volt for everything else, which would be a very unwise decision. But you can you have some some latitude in the decision. And oftentimes we would say that V will be bigger than one volt. What we really want is for it to be sufficiently large that you could drop a voltage across it which is going to somehow turn off the transistor in a meaningful way. And the reason is, if we go back up to uh, diagram. Let's imagine that for some reason this transistor gets hotter. That will mean that more collector current will flow, which could make the transistor get hotter still. It depends on the, the material system um, and the particular type of transistor. But for the sake of argument, if that happens then we will drop a larger voltage across VE because we'll say that VIC and IE are equal. So there'll be a bigger voltage structure across here, but this voltage will still be the same. So the only thing that can happen is VBE can get a bit smaller, which will have to turn off our transistor slightly, which will make our IC drop a bit, which will cause the VE to drop a bit, which will cause VBE to get a little bit bigger, which will turn on the transistor a little bit. And we will keep going around in this loop, which happens, as far as we're concerned, infinitely fast. 
to set up the conditions of the transistor to be constant. And this is a kind of negative feedback. If we didn't have RE and we didn't have R2, so we had essentially circuit 2 but without R2 and with R equal to 0, we would not have the ability to control the quiescent conditions like that. R2 gives us the same ability, so we can get rid of RE. But in circuit 1, there is no R2, so we only have RE to do that. That's why it's, that's why it's necessary. So when we're actually choosing IC, we can say, well, what's the load? If we had 100 kilo ohms and 10 volts, you couldn't have an amp as IC because there isn't enough voltage to actually to produce the, there isn't enough voltage in the, the supply to actually allow those signals to, to be there and the quiescent conditions to exist. Generally speaking, RL must actually be smaller than the input impedance of whatever is connected <coughs> to the output of the amplifier. So what I mean by that is this amplifier will have to be connected to something. There will have to be another circuit here. And that circuit will have, we we'll impress upon it some voltage and it will probably draw some current if it doesn't have an infinite <coughs> impedance. And it probably won't have. Um, so we must make sure that whatever we do connect here doesn't affect the circuit that we are producing. And the way that we manage that is by making sure the value of RL is quite a lot smaller than whatever the impedance is looking into our next, our next stage or our next circuit or whatever it might be. Could be a peak detector, for example. In your first year project, you've got a circuit that's it's not this circuit, but it isn't dissimilar. And hanging off the emitter, there's a little peak detector network, and that's that's the fifth part of that that circuit. By the way, have you all got the email I sent around yesterday yeah. with the quiescent conditions? So, how many briefly are still struggling? You are brave, not only for saying that you're struggling, but for carrying on struggling. Do you want a biscuit for struggling? It's all right. Okay. Did you you were struggling? Did you want a biscuit for struggling? Uh, so struggling and chivalrous, excellent. <laughs> so we're going to say that RL is going to be considerably smaller than the, the input impedance at the next stage. And the idea of input impedances will become a bit more clear when we start talking about op amps because we'll end up connecting some op amps together. And and then we'll have to worry about how they drive each other and what their, their input impedances are. Um, as I said right at the beginning, R1 and R2 should be as large as possible. But we've got to make sure that whatever base current flows, the current that... All right, there's some notes um, there, in fact. Um, whatever base current flows has to be less than a tenth of whatever I1 is. So we can't make R1 and R2 infinitely large because then we'll have no bias <coughs> at all. So this is this is familiar, is it? I hope. Familiar from a week ago or so. This is an excellent diagram for describing what has to happen in terms of voltages. And I'm going to go through it again just in case it wasn't clear from, from last time. Um, we're saying that 1.3 volts will be our emitter voltage, so this is across RE, and that our base voltage will be at 2 volts because we've got 0.7 across there. And then we said, well, we want the maximum available swing, so we'll have to set our output quiescent point. So this is the voltage on the collector with respect to ground. And we'll choose 6 because that allows us to go up by 4 volts and down by 4 volts. It's 6 less 2 takes down by 4. And this is a situation in which, provided we've, we've chosen one point, if we said one, we could make this a bit smaller, and we could move six down a little bit and have a slightly bigger swing. But since we've chosen 1.3, this is the, the same graph from last week when I did choose 1.3, um, that will give us our maximum available swing. And that's pretty much what I've said on that slide. <coughs> the next thing we need to talk about is passing signals between amplifiers into and out of amplifiers and also getting rid of signals where we don't want them. 
because the negative feedback that we've described briefly um, will affect the signals as well as the DC conditions and the effect of the negative feedback on the signal is to make it smaller. That is to say, we'll reduce the gain of our amplifier and that isn't desirable, although the effects of negative feedback are sometimes desirable in amplifiers, that isn't to do with these amplifiers, so it's not a generalisation. In the future you will meet amplifiers where the negative feedback is critical in setting up all sorts of different things. But for now, we need to remove signals from certain points in the circuit in order to get the maximum gain we can. And the removal of signals is called decoupling. On the other hand, we somehow need to get the signals into our circuit as well, because otherwise we won't be able to amplify them. And the getting in and out of signals is called coupling. So, way back in lecture 9, just after Christmas, um, I gave a little circuit for a compressor with a diode, and we were varying the the uh, dynamic resistance of the diode to make it part of a potential divider because the TV was too loud or, or something I made up to give the example. Um, in that we used a blocking capacitor. Um, that's just another word for a coupling capacitor and it keeps, keeps the DC out of our amplifier but allows the signals through. The other thing it does is stops the DC in our amplifier from affecting our signal source. So, we don't have to use capacitors. Amplifiers can be coupled with transformers as well, and if you're into guitar or valves or whatever, you might be reading some older books, and you'll find lots of transformer-coupled amplifiers, and they'll have whole chapters about them. Um, it's pretty uncommon at low frequencies nowadays, although in RF applications, it's still done very regularly. We will only worry about RC-coupled amplifiers in this course, um, but transformer-coupled amplifiers are predictably called transform a couple of amplifiers. So if we were to add the capacitors on for circuit 1, we have C1, C2 and C3. And C1 couples the circuits from the source of voltage, which is V in. You can draw a little senior sort of voltage source there if you want to. And it may be the case that our voltage input has maybe, I don't know, 5 plus 10 sine omega t, plus 5, if you like, in which case we've got 5 volts DC and 10 volts AC. We don't really want the 5 volts in our circuit because we want R1 to be uh, the voltage across R1 to set up 0.7 plus whatever we've decided R E ought to be. And that may not be 5 or whatever, whatever the signal source. DC voltage is. So to make sure the two voltages don't interact with each other, we'll put C1 in and what's the impedance of the capacitor at zero frequency? This is definitely 117 stuff. Hang on, there were several. You said infinite, didn't you? Who, what was it over here? Did I hear zero? Well, I think you can probably have a biscuit for infinite. Well, I think it's the easiest biscuit in the whole wide world. Yeah. Yeah. Catch? Yeah. Obviously, I did a quick risk assessment. There were no students I could hit. None of you could have been killed. <laughs> It'd be on the news, wouldn't it? A student with a biscuit sticking out of his head or her head. Right, so C2, C2 decouples the emitter node. This is the one that causes a lot of trouble sometimes. I said earlier that if we had some collector current and the, the transistor got a bit warmer, a bigger collector current could flow, could be caused to flow, and that that would cause a bigger voltage drop across RE. The voltage across R1 is fixed, so VB would have to get a bit smaller because RE was getting a bit bigger, and that would turn off the transistor somewhat, which would lower the collector current. Same goes for the signals. Towards the end of the lecture, I think, I've, or possibly in the next lecture, I have a diagram like this, but with all the signal shapes drawn on for current and voltage, and you can see how they act with <coughs> each other um, go away a bit. So we need only DC on this node here. <coughs> to achieve that, we'll make R2. Large capacitor, so that its impedance <coughs> at the frequencies we're interested in is very, very small. And 
the signal current which appears here has a choice between RE and C2, because this is really just a current sharing circuit with frequency dependence. And it will definitely choose C2 if it's got the smaller impedance. So C2's impedance at the frequencies we're interested in will be much, much less than the value of RE. Provided we do that, we should have negligible signal voltage on this node. C3, on the other hand, is, is just like C1, except, <coughs> except that its business is to allow us to take signals out of our amplifier without imposing <coughs> the quiescent voltage on this node on whatever follows. So V out should be composed only of AC parts. For circuit two, <coughs> for circuit two, we've got this extra resistor um, just there, and we need to split it into two because we'll have some signals here, which will be our output signal, and if we just had a resistor connect to the base, our signal would appear here to some degree as well, and we can't allow that because our signal on this node ought to be only our input signal. We can't have the two signals subtracting from each other. So to make the signals unable to pass down this, uh, down this branch, we will decouple the middle of R2 to <coughs> through C4. So C4 and C, C2 in this, in this diagram will perform the same function. They provide a low impedance pathway for AC components into the ground. So what about a small signal model? And we had a small signal model for a diode, and we had a large signal model for a transistor, and we worried about switching circuits, and we said that there was a large signal model that dealt with when the transistor was switched off, and a large signal model that dealt with when the transistor was switched on. And for the diode, we said, both for the Zener diode and for the four bias normal silicon diode, we could say it had an internal impedance, and it had 0.7 in the case of the normal diode, or the Zenodiode breakdown voltage in the case of the Zenodiode. And the small signal bit is that dynamic resistance. And the reason it was small signal is because the value of the resistor wasn't fixed. It depended on how much current was flowing in the diode. Well, the transistor is falling along similar lines. So I can say, just as large signal and small signal models were developed for the diode, and large signal models were developed for the transistor, in switching situations, a small signal model for the transistor <coughs> exists. <coughs> and I've been going on about it, now you're probably bored, of transconductance is the mechanism by which three term amplifying devices operate. So it's transconductance that we're going to worry about when we work out what our small signal model should be. And when I say transconductance, what I mean is a small change in VBE um, gives rise to a larger change in IC. That's the, the collector current. And I said already as well that if we were at some operating point, so this is our, our quiescent condition. We've got some constant value of VBE, which is going to be about 0.7, and we'll have some constant value of IC, which we either picked or worked out based on the, based on the question or the problem we're solving. So this could be a couple of milliamps, maybe. It could be a few tens of micrograms as well. It may be a couple of amps. It depends on your situation. So whatever it is, there will be a slope, a tangent to this, this curve, and the curve will take the exponential shape of the transistor, and we'll be able to draw a straight line somewhat like that. And we'll be able to describe this line as a resistor, because there is a change in voltage and a change in current. And it will actually be that the slope of the line is 1 over ohms in terms of units. So that would have Siemens, but we can, we can flip it around to get a value of resistance. If we wanted to know the slope of the line, we differentiate it. Actually, it's, it's not very easy to differentiate equation 8, but we can make a little simplification, which is on the next slide, which does make it easier, and it transpires that DIC by dVBE is, well, I'm not going to read it, is what it says there, is if you differentiate an exponential, you ought to expect to get another exponential with some terms outside. Um, if you're unhappy with it, I guess you better get a table of differential and integral uh, solutions.
But if a diode is conducting, we can say that EQVD upon KT is much, much, much greater than 1. Is everybody happy with what T, K and Q are? Q is the electron charge, which is? And K is? Which is? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's on your exam paper anyway. So what's Avogadro's number? Chemistry. General hubbub, nothing known for sure. Right, anyway, so if you grab a calculator and try it, you'll find EQKVVE e, uh, e, e, upon KT is, is much greater than one for normal situations. So we can get rid of that minus one because that minus one there can go away because it's it's not really significant. And then we can say that IC is approximately equal to IC0 e to the QVB upon KT. <coughs> and we can differentiate that quite easily. That yields the result that I gave on the last slide. And we can say that a small change in IC with a small change in VB is a very small movement about this point. And that is another way of saying how much collector current signal we get for a certain amount of base current signal. And because it's current out and volts in, that means transconductance. And the symbol for transconductance is GM. The G is because it's a conductance, and the M is, is a hangover from when we would have called it neutral conductance. Um, but now we call it transconductance instead, and no one's changed it to a T. <coughs> And this GM is is a fundamental relationship <coughs> which holds over more than nine orders of magnitude for collector current. And well, I've said remember it. I'm pretty sure it's on the exam script. But you don't need to remember this derivation. You can just remember the answer because this derivation will never ever change. Well, not for a bipolar transistor anyway. If we look back at lecture 13, I gave you several generalised amplifiers. Um, now, secretly, these belong, all these sort of boxes belong to a bit of circuits called four port networks, but, sorry, two port networks, but we won't get into that, and I don't think it would do you any good to read about it because I never found it very useful. I don't. I don't think it would add to your the weight of your knowledge much. Not now, anyway. You'll need it later on. So this was a generalised transconductance amplifier, and I said when I was talking about it before that we had a problem because we've got four wires coming out, but a transistor's only got three terminals. So we're going to have to do something about that, and we're going to connect the lower two terminals together in order. <laughs> to say that the emitter is this bit down the bottom. And then the base and the collector occupy the other two electrodes. And this is a good low frequency model for a JFET, and MOSFET and valve. And <coughs> I'm saying that the resistance between the base and the emitter is infinite. Well, that can't be the case. It can't be the case because we know there's some recombination of carriers in the base, and we know that a base current flows. A base current cannot be flowing through an infinite resistance. So we need to do something about that. And what we'll have to do is say, well, what's, what's the impedance looking into the base towards the emitter? And then we'll use Ohm's law to figure out what our small signal base resistance ought to be. So we're looking for an R B, and the R is small because it's to do with a small signal. When I say small, I mean lowercase, not capitalised. So we're hoping for dVBE upon dIB. That's to say a small change in base emitter voltage and a small change in base current. So that's R is V over I. So really all we've got here is, is Ohm's law in differential form. And we know what dVBE by dIC is. This is our GM that we just derived. 
And we also know what DIC by DIB is, because this is the amount of collector current you get for a small amount of base current, which is just another word for HFE. <coughs> or beta if you prefer, we can call them the same at low frequencies. So we have DVB by DIC is 1 upon GM. So we can say that, and, and DIC by DIB is, is beta, so that the two ICs go away, and we end up with RB is, is beta upon GM. This is another important relationship. And, okay, beta <coughs> varies quite a lot between transistors, and the way you deal with that is to say, if I choose a transistor from a data sheet, I will know that it's HFE to the nice beta will lie in the range of 75 to 300, for example. And you do your calculations at 75, and you do your calculations at 300, and you make sure that your circuit will work under all situations that you intend to use it, and then you'll be satisfied that you've done as much as you can to make sure that whatever transistor goes in, your circuit's going to be okay. So this is another one that you'll need to remember, because we need to then work out what RBE is. <coughs> So just in case you're unhappy with the, the rate at which the new terminology is coming, beta upon GM is equal to dVB upon DIB, which is another way of saying small or lowercase b, small lowercase b, lowercase e, upon lowercase i, lowercase b. So this is a small change in some large signal stuff. This is some small signal stuff, and these are equal. And so is that. These are all the small signal parameters too. And if we, we multiply through the, the equation system, <coughs> we'll get GMVB is equal to beta times IB. <coughs> and this is, this is the equation that lots of people like to talk about when they say you can think about bipolar transistor as a, a current amplifier or a voltage amplifier. The uh, transconductor amplifier, sorry. It's true that you can think about it as either one, but it's only GM that's really in control. <coughs> beta is an artifact, or is, uh, it's an inconvenience if you like, it's not something which dominates the process by which the transistor amplifies, <clears throat> and it's not something you can use in a, in a good design situation. But it does mean that you can think of a bipolar transistor as a device which accepts an input voltage and outputs a current, that's to say a transconductance amplifier, or a device that accepts an input current and outputs a current as well, a current amplifier. And the choice of how you think about it depends on the situation. Some circuits are easier to solve if the transistor is worried about in terms of the currents that go into the base and, and flow in the collector. Other times it's easier, that's to say you get less equations, if you worry about the voltage on the base and the current flow in the collector. And the only way that you can figure out which you should use is to do some practice and it will slowly become apparent that in one situation you tend to use loops, in another situation you tend to use nodes. And you will, hopefully, if you're working your way through the problem sheets, have realised that some questions are easier with nodes than they are with loops, because you end up with less equations. It's the same, the same sort of thing that's going here. Don't forget, of course, that MOSFETs, JFETs and valves can only be thought about in terms of transconductance, because their equivalent of IB would be zero. So if we include the effect of finite RBE, um, a new small signal model for a bipolar junction transistor is, is shown on this slide. And I've written up beta IB or GMVBE. And I'm still saying that that little resistor in the Norton source between the collector and the emitter is infinite. Generally speaking, beta is not equal to HFE. Beta is a small signal parameter and HFE is a large signal parameter. <coughs> if I ask that on exam and you write out that, you'll get a mark, but that doesn't mean you understand what's actually being said there. <coughs> Beta is a parameter which can vary with frequency. HFE is only true of DC. In this course, we will not worry about the frequency response of these amplifiers, so as far as we're concerned, beta is equal to HFE, and you can use them interchangeably. That will not always be the case. And when you do some more analog later on, you will have to start worrying about the differences. 
but that isn't coming for quite some time. We could add other circuit elements to, to improve our model of the transistor. As I, I said briefly, there are some inter-electro capacitances, and we could add them on, but I'm not going to because this is the only thing that you have to worry about for this course, but you may as well know they exist. If we were to make this resistor a real value, it would contribute to the slight slope of the output characteristics. You are familiar with output characteristics. We have done them a couple, of, a couple of lectures ago. If you're not happy with them, the handout that went around with that lecture has a good rundown on input and output characteristics and transconductors, that sort of thing. There is a slight slope in those lines, and that is due to that, the existence of that resistance. And that resistance is all the, the physical processes that happen to make that resistance exist is called the early effect. And um, you can read about it if you wish. That's more or less all I have for today. I nearly gave you an example of the second circuit. One is coming. And then after that we discussed some biasing circuits and we said that there was almost always some compromise required in the design. And we talked about coupling for a bit. And then I said that sometimes we need to make sure there is no signal on certain nodes. And that will become more apparent when we look at small signals um, directly after Easter. And at the end I started developing a small signal model for the bipolar junction transistor. And we will go on to do some calculations with small signals in amplifiers when we get back after Easter. And then I have a couple of lectures on operational amplifiers. And then I'm going to spend a lecture or two going through last year's exam to make sure that we are all interacted with at least one exam paper. Because I suspect that my exam is the first that you will take in this university. And that might be a bit of a, a job for you. So I want to make sure that you're as prepared as I can get you on my own. Most of the preparation has to be done by you, but we will go through one in a theatre. There he is.